Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Blair Embry. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Prison Yoga Project, and we are so excited to have you here today for the invitation, which is the art of facilitation. And we invite program directors and facilitators with Prison Yoga Project. And today our very special guest is Jen Lindgren. She is part of our core team. She is the director of New Hampshire, and she is also the lead facilitator for our yoga teacher training, yoga, social justice, and leadership. And we're so excited to have Jen here today with us. And I'm going to read her bio. And then, um, well, actually, I'll do a little housekeeping, too. So I'll tell you a little bit about the framework of how our webinars go, because I know we have new people, we have old people. Um, so I'm going to do introductions. And then Jen's going to lead us in a centering opportunity. And what I really love about this is that you have an opportunity to see how uh, different people in our organization lead trauma informed centering or mindfulness meditation opportunities. And then Jen and I will be in dialogue for about 3040 minutes, and then we'll transition into question and answer. So this is really an opportunity for you to engage uh, with one of our main facilitators and ask any questions about what it's like to teach a yoga teacher training or uh, teach in incarcerated settings. Um, and so when that time comes, and I'll repeat all of this, um, but on your Zoom screen, you have a black bar at the bottom. And on the right hand side, there's a question and answer box. And throughout any time during the webinar, you can put your questions into this box. Um, and then we'll get to these towards the end of the webinar. So yeah, thanks for the little bit of the housekeeping. And yeah, so we have Jen Lindgren, who is an experienced registered yoga teacher trainer and also a facilitator for Yoga for Cancer. She joined Prison Yoga Project in 2019 as chapter director for New Hampshire. Jen has been facilitating trauma-informed and healing-centered yoga classes to incarcerated individuals since 2017, including the instruction of 200-hour yoga teacher training programs. Jen's passion for movement and movement-based therapy began in the late 90s working with at-risk youth to share dance and interpretive movement for connection and confidence. This connection to healing through movement has guided her studies to become a yoga therapist. It has inspired a passion for offering yoga and movement inclusive and accessible beyond a dance or yoga studio setting. Everyone, please welcome Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Blair. Thank you to everyone who's here. Um, yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> Will you lead us in uh, facilitation? I would love to. Uh, welcome, folks. We we really like to establish just a little bit of, of welcoming into the space whenever we come together as community um, and webinars in our in our practices, just to, to kind of transition from wherever you may have been today um, into this space that we're about to share um, in community with one another. So take a moment just to notice where you're sitting, where you're standing, if you're traveling, uh, wherever you are currently listening uh, to these words and to this space. And you know, if you're able to maybe just look around the space that you're sitting in or you're occupying, take in your surroundings, notice the space that you're occupying physically. Noticing how you might be feeling. If you're like me, you're a little anxious right now. You've got some extra energy going on within your body. You may be relaxed or tired or just anticipating what's to come. So take a moment just to get acquainted with yourself in this moment. And as you do that, the next time you take a breath in, notice your inhale how it feels to accept that breath into your body. And when you're ready, let it go. And I invite you to take a few moments this way, noticing how your breath feels as you bring it into your body. Maybe there's some expanse to your chest, a change in your posture. Maybe that breath is quick or short and you've already exhaled a few times but take a few moments to deliver what your body needs as far as bringing in this new moment, this new breath, enjoying that fullness and that feeling, and then releasing, maybe letting go of a little more than your exhale. Noticing what else you're carrying with you in this moment that maybe you don't need.
Taking time as you inhale to, to maybe lift your shoulders up towards your ears to feel any sensations that that brings. And as you exhale, let them gently come down. And if that felt good, maybe add that little gentle rolling of the shoulders as you inhale and exhale. And if your body's like mine, you're hearing lots of Rice Krispie noises, all sorts of things from wherever you've been so far today. And the next time you exhale, just let the body drop down. Let your chin rest down towards your chest. Again, just noticing any sensations that your body is delivering to you. If it suits you, slowly bring your head from side to side. Recognizing places where this feels particularly nice or just an opportunity for you to be curious about what your body needs in this moment. And then when you're ready on your next inhale, bring your head back up, maybe lifting your arms out to the sides or overhead. Again, wherever they flow naturally, wherever they're comfortable, breathing in and then bringing them back down. Again, maybe some circles with the arms. Bringing the fingertips forward towards the front of your body and then opening them wide. And again, just taking time to inhale and to exhale. Letting your hands gently come down to your lap or maybe even to your heart and your belly. Noticing that unique rhythm of your heart your breath. <laughs> Recognizing that that unique rhythm is only for you, that you're the only one whose heart and breath make this rhythm. Feeling your body expand as you breathe in, softening as you let go. Letting the arms relax. Letting the body soften and easing into this space, into this moment. As you rest here, again, bringing your awareness to the sounds, to the smells, to the lights and shadows of your space. Coming back into this moment. Gently easing your eyes back to our space. And again, we welcome you. Thank you so, so much for being here. I'm so excited to share some things with you. So welcome. Thank you, Jen. What is your first memory of yoga? Mm -hmm. I coughed. I missed what you said. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What's your first memory of yoga? So um, my first memory of yoga, I was working in a bar, <laughs> um, a little underage. I was really stressed out. Um, and a friend of mine had just come back from a teacher training. This was probably 1996, 97-ish. Um, and we did breathing practices and movements on the top of a pool table. And it was just like a really, it was after hours, the bar had closed. We didn't do much side work because we were kind of stressed out. And just like, come, come over here with me. Um, and I was instantly in love. I had been a dancer growing up. And this was a whole, just a different way to connect and to soften and to calm down. Um, I've not done yoga on a pool table since that day, but it's not, not been part of my life. Um, I got a bunch of DVDs, or they were actually VHS tapes at the time, because it was the 90s, they weren't DVDs yet. Um, so I bought like Sean Korn VHS and Rodney Yee, and I had just a bunch of yoga videos that I did because I couldn't afford or find studios. Um, so I practiced a little bit with my friend who was trained uh, and then just practiced a bit, um, yeah, on VHS tapes in my basement. <laughs> trying to learn the postures and the practices. 
Um, and it was a really good transition from dance because I, you know, after college and or in the midst of college uh, and after high school, I, I couldn't find dance companies anymore. So my first sort of intro into it was much more about finding another way to to connect with with movement and with my body. Um, so it was, yeah, an instant an, an instant love. <laughs> There's so many aspects. Well, one, I didn't know about the pool story. That's amazing. That's amazing. And yeah, and like also having worked in the service industry for a long time too, right? After a five or eight hour shift, it is high intensity, high anxiety, you know, and you're like, okay, what? It's 3 a.m. and I'm supposed to just go home and go to bed, right? So um, definitely ends up, you kind of end up living in a little bit of a different world. So I love that you, you know, had a coworker that was able to give you these resources. Um, and then also I grew up dancing. That was my first love, you know? And I think um, not having a studio that you dance at anymore, it really is such a, a loss. It's a loss of um, having the time to move and dance. And then it's also a loss of community. And so where did your yoga practice grow from there? Oh, well, it from, so <laughs> my next, for I, I was pregnant. <laughs> um, I actually found out that I was pregnant on 9-11 of 2001. Um, on that day, I woke up and just the, the way that the day went along, I was really nauseous and thought, hmm. Um, so my 9-11 took a little bit of a different direction. And I was leaving in two weeks from 9-11 to spend a semester in England, um, which I ended up doing. So in the aftermath of 9-11, I was in the UK. Uh, for several months, but I actually started prenatal yoga with a midwife in the UK and then came back and continued. Um, so my first actual yoga classes and lessons were prenatal um, in 2001 after 9-11, um, but really learning kind of that aspect, which Again, for, for anyone who has learned about or practiced um, prenatal yoga, it's your, your body's doing so many things that are so different. And to be able to have the foundation of a practice of yoga to learn how to sort of where your posture is and to relearn how to hold your body and how to prepare your body for the sort of this next transitional phase um, was a really fortunate thing to sort of be able to do and to bring me deeper into my own yoga. Um, from there, I, again, it was sort of mommy and me things that I, a lot of my yoga has been um, books and, and tapes and things that I think sort of, we talk so much about the accessibility of yoga and most of my life, it, it really couldn't afford, it continued my life, I couldn't afford um, many things. So, but libraries are amazing and there's a really a great deal of resources and things so I learned you know mommy and me prenatal yoga and infant massage and kind of grew it from there um and then in my own healing the next time I had entered into yoga studios um my husband had had an accident when we were young my daughter was three and post sort of the recovery of a lot of that he had traumatic brain injury ended up passing a couple years after so I came back to the yoga studio or I came into a yoga studio at that time sort of to heal. Um, but it was like the angry yoga at that point. It was like, the, I'm gonna beat up my body and I'm just gonna come in here. And like, there was no, there was no eight limbs to my yoga at that point. It was definitely like, I'm a young mom. I am pissed at the whole world. You know, and you know, we can go a little bit into generational trauma and the history pre this point, um, but all sorts of shit was going down in my head, and I didn't want to mess up my daughter, <laughs> so it seemed like yoga at that point was a way for me not to turn into that like raging tiger of hatred and just be a, a better mom and a better human. Um, so it even evolved from there too. Like, there's many, many steps to it. Um, but it was sort of in that time when I started to study and learn more about trauma and more about everything that we store and hold in our body through our whole lives and all these experiences. So that really became the shift, um, you know, probably about 2010-ish, where I really started to concentrate more on, you know, this practice actually is quite healing when you let it be and you, you're 
you're tired of beating yourself up um, and being injured all the time and, and escaping from your body um, and just sort of brought things back together slowly. It's always a journey. It's <laughs> but yeah, so it's sort of, it continues to evolve still, but that was sort of my initial introductions and then the slow kind of process of recognizing how beneficial this practice was to my sanity, to my health, to my well-being, to my presence within my family um, and my community that it, it sort of, you know, it delivers what it says, that if you're willing to look for that mind-body-spirit connection, it, it's, you know, it can be there, um, or you can ignore that completely and <laughs> tear your muscles. <laughs> and was there a time or a shift for you that you felt like you wanted to facilitate <clears throat> yoga? Um, I was actually at, so I, while my daughter was growing up, I was a medical office manager um, and working just and waitressing, doing sort of all the jobs and all the things and taking yoga recreationally when I could. Um, I attended a workshop and the leader of the workshop asked where I taught. And he said, I'm not a yoga teacher. And he said, well, why not? And from that moment, it like a little tiny spark sort of said, yeah, why not? I love this. I love to teach. I love to teach movement. Um, I had taught dance always when I was younger as well. And it wasn't, wasn't teaching anything. I think for anyone who works administratively in the medical system, a little tiny bit of it is about caring for people. But depending on the organization that you're from and where you are, it became much more administrative and a, and a profit thing that didn't suit me. Um, so I actually left, um, you know, a 15 year career in health management when my daughter started middle school and went and decided that I was gonna go to YTT um, with not support from my family. Everyone thought I was insane. And, you know, I remember my stepdad telling me it was the biggest mistake ever. And I was so irresponsible. And why would I leave, you know, a stable job with a child to go and pursue this wacky stuff? Um, but it was one of the things that, like, and we talk a lot in the YTT about like that tiny, tiny little voice that's kind of like here. And it, it sort of says like, please listen to me. I really know what I'm talking about and every other voice sort of beats it up and quiets it. Um, but I, I knew it was time to start listening to that voice. And I knew that this was the, the path that I was supposed to be following. Um, yeah, so it was a faithful workshop and someone just sort of asking me where I taught and put the bug in there. And I haven't, thankfully it's, it's been magic since then. Um, yeah, the first place I started teaching was to some women who were um, hostesses at the restaurant that I had worked at at the time. And they very willingly just trusted me to learn with them in their bodies. And, um, and then as soon as I was certified, I started working in the women's prison in our, our area. So, and it just kind of went from there. <laughs> so what was, the decision for you to teach outside of a studio setting and also teach to system impacted people? Um, it, it was never not the thing, I guess. I So when I was growing up, um, and then we'll back, we can jump all around, right? We'll do lots of tangents, folks, and then I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a tangent fun. Um, but when I was growing up, my mom and my dad biological were 15 and 17 when I was born. And I really lived with a lot of assorted caregivers and a lot of assorted, my grandparents on and off. Um, my biological dad was only in the picture until I was two. Um, there's a great deal of generational trauma in my collective space and family, lots of different families and things. Um, my grandfather was a counselor in a youth detention center all through my childhood. Um, 
you know, my mom was a nurse. It just, we were system impacted my entire life. And it just, I think for me, the practice of yoga, again, going back to library books and DVDs and VHS tapes and things that once I really started to learn what this practice was, I knew that people who could go to studios could go to studios and they'd find it and it'd be there. But it was really important to me right away to, to bring it into schools and to bring it into prisons and to see where folks who might benefit from this practice were and how could we go there. You know, I remember working with, with kids groups and different things and you know, went in and did the training for yoga for cancer. It you know, working with veteran populations, there's just yoga studios are incredible. We're so fortunate that there's so many. Um, but they kind of take care of themselves and the folks who, who, you know, enjoy yoga and they can go, um, it's part of the privilege and it's part of a, 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 you know, a thing that a lot of people are lucky to do, but so many more are not. And it just, that's where this practice belongs that, you know, it's, I think the yoga community in and of itself has gotten not the reputation it deserves. Like it's not understood universally how healing and how beneficial and how much of a truly a mental health and a wellness practice this is that, you know, because of the way social media has treated it, it is a, a fancy thing, or we're gonna, we're gonna be in pretzels and we're just, we're all just lovely and slender and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, it's so far from what this practice actually can offer. And it just, that's where it was important to share it anywhere. Any, anyone who wants to learn, who is either intimidated to go into a studio or just can't, or they can't find one. Um, I think we should be in community centers. We should be everywhere that people are who have had hurt and pain and are still feeling uncomfortable in their body. Like people deserve to be comfortable in their head and in their body. And wherever those people are who, who aren't and weren't raised with tools, you know, and are continuing to sort of experience just the struggles of discomfort within yourself. This practice is so beneficial and that's where we should go. It's why we, it was really important to, to make this training accessible and to push it in a way that like, if you feel that way too, please come and be part of this training to because we need, we need all the teachers out there too. We still need all the studios and all the wonderful people who've been bringing yoga you know, in this country, but we also need folks who um, are willing to go everywhere. So. And so you've been teaching in uh, incarcerated settings now since 2017. And then you also created a yoga teacher training for the women inside of the prison. Will you? Tell us about that journey. Yeah, it's I can't really take credit for it. I don't know if Nicole's here today. So anyway, the first the first day that I went as a brand new yoga teacher to go and meet with um, the chaplain and one of the women who was a, a yoga participant in the women's prison in New Hampshire. Um, for anyone who knows New Hampshire, I know Jen Tromley's out there um, when they were still in Goffstown. Um, you know, I, I taught the hostess ladies in, in my, <laughs> in the restaurant I had worked at and, a, you know, a few other people and um, a few classes here and there. But I walked in and you know, shook hands with the chaplain and the woman um, who had come in, who had really been participating anytime any yoga teacher would come. And it was really sporadic that, you know, they'd have a teacher for a few weeks, a few months, a few this and that. Um, but she was really passionate with being able to keep a sustainable yoga program there because she felt so much um, benefit from the practice. So I walked in and before she even said anything to me, she had a, a like a, um, a photocopy of an article and she put it in my face. And it was from Yoga Journal and it was a story about Kath Meadows who did a teacher training in Maryland and she said, when can we do this here? <laughs> um, and it was like four months after I had gotten certified. Like, I don't even know what it takes to do a YTT. I don't, I don't know any of these things. Um, but I instantly 
instantly felt that it was the next thing that that her words just sort of sparked something and I was going to do everything I could to make it happen um so whether I was the teacher whether I was the facilitator we were going to get a program into the women's prison somehow some way um and it started then in, in 2019, so it took two years. I needed two years anyway, because you, you have to teach many, many thousands of hours. You have to do a lot more training um, to write a syllabus and learn you know, more than you know when you're a new person um, finishing your YTT. Um, and really customized it and built for everything that I was learning about healing from my own trauma, from getting to know these women who were coming into the classes and really structured, you know, not only the, the criteria and the components that are necessary, because we, we'd ended up going through Yoga Alliance and, um, you know, just wanting to make sure that the product we were getting, that, that for these women to be certified, once they were released, they can go to a yoga studio, they can go and get a job. So I wanted to make sure not only were we replicatable <laughs> and we were following all the things, um, but that it was also, again, being able to offer the lessons of self-healing as well first. So I think for anyone who, you know, whether you're yoga for service going out into communities or whether you're offering yoga in a studio because folks are still hurting there too, um, to have this awareness of your own level of healing, of your own assumptions and biases within yourself, of your own health and, and ability to serve, I think, to, to go in for anyone in any kind of service industry, whether you're a teacher, matron, all the service industries are all amazing, and but they're energy suckers. And it's so much that anytime you're going into any kind of service, to be able to understand how to connect and preserve your, your own energy and to understand where where your needs are and how can you truly serve and teach and guide someone to find their path in their voice. And it's so much about that, that it was really important in creating this YTT to, to allow these women to find their voice again, to allow, you know, for these women to, to connect with who they are, to kind of, and I think so much of the foundation of this program is truly that, that you're your first student, that, you know, wherever, wherever things still sit within you before you go out and serve to give you this really beautiful foundation of yoga. And for anyone in the room um, who studied this practice, it's really custom built for healing and it's custom built for service that, that it, this practice was designed to say, not only like as the human condition, are we suffering from so many different afflictions that are, are brought about by the, just being human? But the way that we understand ourselves and follow our own path truly can guide us through. It doesn't take the hurt away. It doesn't take all the stuff that's happening. But when you're able to face the world out there, united within your head and your body, and then go forward. And that was really the gift, you know, that I got from yoga, that I want to share and pass on from yoga, that, you know, we say all the time that if you go through this YTT and you realize at the end that the service that you're meant to give is still just to you, like, yay, that's a huge win, that it doesn't mean, you know, you can come out of, of any sort of self-study realizing you just still need to concentrate on you, you know, and then maybe things start to happen and you start to decide that service comes in as well. Um, I don't even know if I answered the question, but it really, it, it was, it was an evolution of my continued healing of learning, you know, meeting new, incredible, wonderful people who were just working really, really hard to heal, working really, really hard to overcome the stigma of their position to sort of say, you know, you're labeled a convict or a felon or all these words that society uses, but how can you have permission within yourself to say, you know what, I, I know that I'm a rock star. I know that I'm meant to do what these small voices are saying and to then have just the tools to kind of continue to hold that space for yourself and continue to, to connect and to be comfortable in your head and your body.
it's kind of just all about that. Like it really, because we don't tend to see everyone else around us when we're not comfortable in here. And the more we're able to find that, that contentment and that peace, you know, again, even with all the absurd, ridiculous things happening in our country right now, um, the more that we can be comfortable here and see everyone else for who they are and the work that they're doing rather than a different agenda. Um, yeah, that feels a lot better than not contributing in that way. <laughs> and what were some themes that you saw for, you know, I don't want to ask like, oh, what did you learn from, you know, creating a yoga teacher training? Because I know the list would be endless of all of the things that you learned, but were like, were there themes that came forward that you didn't really expect when you were teaching inside? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it was much more, I was like a lot of women ended abusive relationships or repaired broken relationships. But I think that there was a great deal of community developing within a facility that communities aren't encouraged. So the women who are part of the yoga program would have a conflict with another woman somewhere within the facility, but rather than continue that conflict, they'd say, hey, why don't you come to yoga? You know, why don't you do this? And it was just really, I think from just like the immersion of, of this level of connection of people finding their own voice. I remember there was one and it's just my favorite memory. Um, the way that we had done the in-person kind of posture training is that, you know, there were 10 women who went through the training together, all different backgrounds, body types, styles, just beautiful variety of folks. So we would each kind of work on each posture to show the embodiment of each individual and how this posture feels and looks within um, everyone and then offer sort of the invitational cues to, you know, well, how does it feel if you roll your shoulder back a little? Or what do you notice when you kind of, um, you know, elongate your spine or do whatever? And for these sort of moments, I would just listen and observe and each woman would kind of go and the, the one who was practicing the posture, everyone else would sort of offer again, these sort of little feedbacks. And the woman who was practicing was coming into cobra pose. So it's a little back bend, you're on your belly and your hands are sort of at your forearms. And someone had cued, you know, just kind of notice if, if you sort of bring your heart forward a little bit. And for anyone who practices yoga or has taught people teaching yoga, there's a really special moment when you recognize that the person practicing feels super good and comfortable. And she just like came up into this cobra pose and everyone, the other nine women went, oh, that's it. And it just, it, oh, it was so, it was beautiful that, that you know, it deepened the relationship for themselves with each other. Um, you know, women who came into their first yoga class, there was one, it's actually a recording of Leanne um, was a former participant and she actually like sneaked into her first yoga class because she wasn't on the list and supposed to be there. Um, super, super quiet and like wouldn't really talk. And by the time teacher training ended, like she's just, you know, this beautiful voice in this, you know, really strong presence and just this nurturing place. So it, it wasn't so much, like I believed in the yoga before I started, but it was truly seeing the evolution of, of, of folks and this immersion of these voices that, you know, had probably been silenced for a really long time, starting to just be bold and loud and supportive and, and just compassionate towards one another. So it was just a really, um, like that of anything is what hooks you. Why does any teacher teach? It's to, you know, to see the immersion of the students just becoming who they are. And it, it just, it, it doesn't lack in a, in a yoga teacher training setting. And it just, again, that witness of self growth and community growth and just all of that is, yeah, it's magical. <laughs> And we'll have a beautiful opportunity to like offering the space to witness others and not judge others, right? When they were, then when they, they're all watching the woman in Cobra pose, you know, right? And it's, um, 
yeah, it really keeps this openness that it sounds like they were really able to bring to the whole facility, not just yeah. being inside the yoga, the yoga class. Yeah. No, it just, it, yeah. No, it's incredible. It's, it's just, it's awesome. It's so great. We're so, so lucky um, to be able to do this work. And even in when it, when those days feel really heavy and it feels like, you know, our world is just about harm and about, you know, all the things that continue to cause harm, knowing that these environments are here where people are starting to connect and to grow and to, to come back to community is, you know, really nice to focus on and to be able to sort of bring us back to this is where change needs to start and it needs to start in in every room that we're able to come into with every group of people that we're able to to collaborate and and learn from um yeah so it just yeah it was it was just it was really beautiful to see especially in environments where again relationships aren't encouraged to see that it just it it just you, you couldn't help it it just was happening because of the way that these women were starting to connect with themselves and see one another. Um, yeah. And how did you get involved with <coughs> the project? Because you were doing this on your own, like locally. Yeah. So I, I was actually teaching um, some studio classes and a, and a woman had come up to me one day and she said, you have to talk to my neighbor's son. He's in England, but you have to talk to him because he teaches in a prison too, like you do. Um, so she's like, here's all of his information. You send him an email and you talk to him and tell me next week how it goes. <laughs> okay. Um, and it was Jeff Mara, who is the um, UK, is our UK ambassador um, from New Hampshire originally. So I sent him a little email and like so-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so said, I must talk to you. I'm in New Hampshire, I'm doing this work. Um, she told me to ask you about Prison Yoga Project. Um, it was right about the time when, when the teacher training was just about done and we were bringing it into proposal to see if we could do it in the facility. Um, and I needed support because again, it was just me kind of here and you know, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know if there's just more things that I should be offering or I just didn't want to do anything wrong or in a way that wouldn't be beneficial for the women who would go through this training. Um, so I reached out to Jeff and it was really perfect timing because like a month or two after that, James Fox was actually doing a training in Burlington, Vermont, um, which is just a couple hours from me. So I signed up for the training. I drove up in an April snowstorm to Burlington, Vermont. Um, met James for the first time and even from then had sort of started to just be, I guess, really excited to be around other folks who were doing this work and who had had so much experience doing this work and, um, and to recognize that, again, there's this whole community of, of like-minded folks who really believe and, and understand the importance of being able to um, to bring yoga outside of the studio. So that was 2018, uh, like April of 2018. And we started the teacher training like later that summer. And kind of within that time, I started to talk with Nicole, who's our um, assistant director um, and had just begun to, to meet everyone. And then by 2019 in January, um, Nicole said to me one day, she's like, well, just kind of like, you just need to come in and join us. And, you know, we should just start a New Hampshire chapter and we've got this YTT. Um, and then it was another sort of through COVID that we started to really talk about, you know, we have this trauma-informed teacher training. Does, is it something that maybe we can bring outside of facilities to be able to bring more people into the facilities and to, to bring more folks in? So it was another year and a half of sort of turning that into an online platform because it had only been you know, lecture notes and things that were delivered in person. Uh, so to then be able to write uh, all the narratives and the things for the, the online modules. Um, yeah, and then it, so it just, it was a, a, a lovely lady whose neighbor <laughs> is Jeff's mother um, who really introduced me to Prison Yoga Project. Um, and you know the rest is history as they say 
bless mothers. That <laughs> you need to talk to someone, right? Like how, how awesome. So this yoga teacher training that you've developed is now the training that we offer for everyone, right? And so will you tell us how this training grew? So I'll, I'll drop a link too, but this is uh, the focus of this training. And I want you to tell us more about it, but I'll just brief the audience if they don't know. Um, it's yoga, social justice, and leadership. So it's a 200 hour yoga teacher training. And we have had quite diverse groups of individuals come. Previously incarcerated participants, participants that have done our programming on the inside, uh, people that are looking to offer yoga outside of a studio setting, um, and then also people that have done 200 hour yoga teacher trainings, right? Like we're, we're a different training. So will you tell our audience about what the training involves um, and maybe some specific aspects that make it different from other trainings? Yeah, I'm going to try. And again, I go into tangents, so I'm going to try really hard to focus it. Um, I mean, ultimately, again, if you've studied sort of Hatha Yoga and the Eight Limbs of Yoga, um, the Sutras of Patanjali, um, thousands of years ago, people understood <laughs> this human condition and gave a little bit of a tool guide to just sort of say, if you are not comfortable in here, if you don't feel connected to your own body, if you don't feel connected to your own mind, if your essence of your spirituality is lost within this universe, this practice is something that you can add to your toolbox that will, will alleviate some of that and will bring you back to yourself. So when shit hits the fan, you're a united being to go and sort of bring this in. And, you know, it's, it, it's founded in sort of that basic lineage but when you dig a little deeper I have an English lit background so reading you know the Gita and reading the sutras you know it turns it just it becomes analytical to me and it becomes the way to really be able to look and say you know this not only is this practice so much for self-healing but there's so many aspects that that do make a strong leader and make strong community within, within these words and within this practice, and also contribute so profoundly to our treatment of one another to bring in the social justice aspect. So the, the training itself really, again, follows the eight limbs of yoga with a pretty heavy concentration on the yamas and niyamas, which are kind of your, kind of your go-to guide. It's you know, non-harm, we're going to be truthful, we're not going to steal things, um, but it's kind of taking these basic principles and really looking at them from how can this be supportive to your own development of, of your healing, your leadership skills, and how can we apply them socially to the world. Um, so there's 13 modules within it, and each one, again, follows sort of the yamas and yamas with the philosophy piece of it, and then we break down lots of human anatomy, because it's it's also very empowering to understand how this body works, to, to be able to say, and not in a way that this body needs to look and be a certain way, but how does your body function? How do you breathe? What does that do to connect with the rest of your body? And how can sustainable range of motion, movement, and connection, like mindful awareness of your breath, help to sustain your nervous system so it's really taking the practice of yoga that again is so naturally there to, to sort of calm our nervous system but how do you teach it in a way that really utilizes the, the benefits of this practice to get kind of the most bang for your buck so we look at sequencing and again for folks who are familiar with sort of traditional yoga sequencing where it's kind of on a little bit of a bell where you come in and you're centering and then you you sort of get a little warmer you do your work and then you cool down and then you rest and in trauma-informed we're almost stimulating and simulating trauma or the, the embodiment of trauma so when you come in Again, for anyone who's been to a yoga class when, you know, maybe you were stuck in traffic or you had a bad day or you had an argument or you just have a million things in your head, it's really difficult to just come in and, huh, we're just going to, we're going to calmly sit and center. And in a trauma-informed, you start up. So we're going to release that sort of initial energy, but also understand what that does physiologically within the body. 
to then be able to start to learn to self-soothe. So it's really a series of, again, sort of that stimulation and self-soothing. So when we're off the mat and you start to feel this sort of energetic stuff or you know you begin to have a really shallow breathing or just your body is reacting to being human out in this crazy world that you start to develop that muscle memory from their practice on the mat and bring it down. So not only are we learning the aspects of, of facilitating, but the whys behind it. So these are all the ways that you know generational trauma impacts people. This is the way that our assumptions and our biases prohibit us from seeing the people within our community. And how can we sort of use yoga philosophy to heal, to see, and then to be able to get to this place of collaboration and you know, empower everyone who comes into our yoga space to then find their unique voice, to find the folks who are going to be best served from them. And it just sort of grows into something that's far more beneficial and supportive um, than again, what some of our, our government officials are doing now. Uh, I do get a little snarky, so don't like, <laughs> there's, we get deep. And I think to be able to talk, um, you know, again, I, I've got all the ACEs. If anyone knows ACE scores, like a significant history of trauma in my life, like significant violations against my mind and my body for, for most of my, most of my life. Um, and again, with self-medication or self-abuse or all the things that we sort of do to escape from this guilt and shame of life, um, the practice of yoga is the only thing for me that actually made me feel connected back to myself again of all of, you know, prescribed or unprescribed of things. And that's worth sharing. But I think it's also really important to get a base level of understanding within our own self before we go and give to others. So it's 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 foundationally a self-study practice and a self-study course, but you're also learning how to share it. So for every lesson that you learn for, for your own well-being, for your own journey, for your own connection with the practice of yoga, you're also learning how to guide folks to find their own path as well because it, it doesn't look the same for anybody and it shouldn't. We, you know, we're all thankfully, beautifully unique and so should our yoga practice and to be able to have that opportunity. So we talk a lot about the accessibility of yoga. We talk a lot about, you know, yoga as a facilitator, you're not performing when you're in front of a group of individuals. You know, you're, you're allowing your body, your demonstration of the postures to be the most accessible you know, so everyone in the room gets to a place where they feel comfortable and confident. And in a trauma-informed yoga, you know, maybe we'll do like four or five postures in an hour-long class, but it's much more about using, you know, the, the directional planes of the postures to, again, allow the joints and muscles to find their full range of motion for that individual. And then to find the variation of the posture that feels comfortable in each individual's body. And how can you as facilitator encourage that instead of I'm going to fix you and move you and bring you to some other place that it's much more about, again, that empowerment of the individual. So you're going to empower yourself because not all of us allow that to happen. <laughs> um, but what are some tools to be able to, again, understand that you're awesome and believe it and then go and and let someone else understand it too and to say like you're really awesome and let's I know let's find that path for you too um yeah so being a really like hardened angry fearful pissed off cynical individual for most of my 20s um like that still creeps in sometimes but I think it's part of our yoga as well when we keep ourselves in check and kind of bring it back to you know what did what are we really trying to do here as, as humans in this journey and how do we want to show up in the world? So I think that the foundation of it is, you know, a YTT that allows you to figure out how you want to show up in the world. And you're the only one who gets to decide. But yeah, so that's kind of it. <laughs> really, yeah, really finding this, this root of authenticity, you know, and I think <clears throat> also what I hear you say is that, you know, it's an opportunity for you to figure out maybe also where you want to serve. 
right? Mm -hmm. So offering yoga outside of a studio setting. Not everyone from our training goes to teach inside. I know people have gone in to teach in recovery centers. Um, You know more about our graduates. Will you share maybe a little bit more where people have gone to um, facilitate? Oh, absolutely. And it, it does, it really varies that it, some folks are, are educators, so they're going and they're bringing this practice back to their students. Um, some folks are, are actually within the legal system, are, are lawyers and um, either defense or prosecuting attorneys who are actually bringing it and going in with their clients to sort of recognize this other level of sort of mindfulness and calm and connection um, to community. Um, folks who, again, social work, who are, are going in and bringing this in with their clients, um, addiction recovery centers, as you said, uh, again, homes um, and, and locations for veteran populations. Um, you know, a couple of our graduates who are, are living on their indigenous land are able to actually go in and create classes within their community. Um, it's just, it. I think for the folks who, who have come and joined, recognize within their own communities and within their own parts of the world that there are, you know, as soon as you start to look for opportunities where you're, you're called to, to join, there are opportunities there to, you know, some folks are, are just in community centers or they're part of other groups where they have space, where they have, you know, these free classes or um, free for the community. We usually try to charge facilities and really we'll talk about that too. Um, the folks who need the practice should not pay, but if there's lots of, anyway, we'll get into that more. Um, but really everywhere, there's, uh, I think now that we're moving on to our third cohort, but between the first two, um, I wanna say nine different countries were represented within the folks who would come as well. And you know, so not only here in the continental United States, but um, you know, throughout Europe, in Australia, um, in South America, um, Mexico, but yeah, there's just, um, and someone from Canada, but there's just there, which again, brings us back into this place of, of not being so isolated within our individual communities to really be able to, to look out and to recognize that, you know, there are so many more people who give a damn about the people um, than, than we sometimes can see in social media and in the news. And to be able to start to form those connections within community to, to again, recognize that each individual can be so impactful to, you know, of our graduates. We've had 48 graduates at this point. You know, of those 48 graduates teach 10 people, you know, and that keeps continuing to grow and to go out. You know, how many folks are we truly able to touch and impact and introduce to a practice that they may not have otherwise known could could be something that could be beneficial to their own healing. So yeah, they're everywhere. They're doing beautiful things. Um, and they're gonna be mentoring a lot of our former graduates. This first cohort is the first cohort that we're gonna be offering former participants to come back and offer mentor opportunities to, to the folks who are going through it now. So it just, um, the community keeps growing and expanding and it allows for so many more voices to come into the discussion, um, so many more perspectives to be able to learn from and to have just the opportunity to hear all of these really outstanding, incredible stories. Yeah, different bodies, different lived experiences, different profession, professions, different uh, places in the world, right? So like, I think that's what's really beautiful about having the virtual opportunity for this training um, is really getting a diverse community of people studying together. Yeah, I see a question in the chat too from Kim um, about anatomy. Um, so every, and I think I started to say this, it's one of the tangents that had come in. I'm way more focused during our classes, um, but each module has, again, a philosophy section, um, a practical section as far as facilitation, an anatomy section. Um, and then again, we go through sort of trauma-informed sequencing. So each week of the modules, it's pretty, it's, I would say if you've gone through other medical training, it's probably going to be not nearly as intense, but um, we go through the whole body. We're really looking, again, being trauma-informed, we want to be extremely safe 
and understand how different bodies move. So we go through all the joints and muscles, we go through all the directional planes, but we're also looking at internal systems as well to show that by regulating the nervous system, you know, how does this impact the circulatory system? How does it impact the digestive system? How do all of these systems, you know, when we kind of bring in some of the more deeper yoga philosophy, uh, if you're familiar with the chakra system, there's a lot of parallels within, you know, the chakra system and then where trauma sort of sits in our body. So, you know, if you, your root chakra, uh, again, I, I had 31 homes in my life. I moved 14 times before I was in second grade. My root chakra of feeling <laughs> supported and fixed and having a place to rest, it has been messed up most of my life. And that's sort of where like our bowel dysfunction and our digestion sits within. But to again, sort of have an understanding of your own physiology, your own anatomy, how do you can also apply it, what you might be aware of or looking for in the folks that you're working with of what their histories might be that are also contributing to, to the functions of their body. Is it's again, it's really empowering to start to understand how and why your body works the way it does. And what are you able to do to, to advocate for yourself medically to, you know, sometimes, you know, we find more and more, especially in the facilities that, you know, the healthcare is not what it could be or should be. Um, and that women are trying to advocate for themselves and not being taken seriously. And I think that that happens in many, many populations where you try to go and you speak to a medical professional. Um, so again, this isn't gonna be a medical degree. We're not coming there, but to have a basic understanding of this feels right, this feels wrong and kind of what's right and normal for your own body. So we, we approach anatomy more in that way that we want to be safe, we want to understand basic functions in anatomy, but we also want to have a deeper understanding of your body as a unit. It's mind, body, spirit connection and knowledge of how your body works is, is a big part of what we discuss. Um, and so I, I kind of dropped it into the uh, chat, but we're going to transition perfectly into question and answer period. Um, and so just wanted to um, also vocally invite that in. So you're welcome to drop your questions into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Um, and then we have another question from Kim. Um, can you talk about the timeline and the general structure? So maybe the hours of self-study um, of this training and I'm gonna drop in dates. Um, yeah. So the entire program is 15, 16 weeks. And there's 13 self-paced learning modules. But when we meet, so we meet for three and a half hours on Thursdays and we discuss sort of the previous week's modules. So there'll be lecture during that time of whatever was in that module, if that makes sense. Um, we kind of have estimated through these past two cohorts that you're looking at five-ish hours a week of online study. Um, and that includes, each one has um, some videos, there's some different supplemental materials within the body of the, the online modules that take some time. So each one, um, again, for your online module, you've got your, your basic philosophy, you have your, um, your anatomy sections. A lot of the anatomy sections not only have a little narrative, but they'll have some animation videos. So again, let's look at the function of the shoulder girdle and how does that work? And we'll have you know, a skeletal or a muscular animation. Um, so again, we estimate five-ish hours for that, our three and a half hours that we're together. And then it, things shift a little bit. So the first two modules are a little heavier um, in, just a couple weeks in, um, sort of towards the end of July, we have that last week of July off from live, which is a little bit of a catch up time to be able to just catch up with the modules. Um, we do give opportunities for folks to sort of meet independently to create study groups and things. Um, but then kind of after that, once we get into the sixth and seventh week, we've gotten the bulk of the anatomy stuff out of the way. And then we get a little bit more into the actual direct facilitation. So right from the start during our live meetups, we start with some lecture um, and then we will go into a demonstrative video. So whatever postures um, and section of a trauma-informed sequence we'll be discussing that week, 
I'll demonstrate, you know, a 20 minute movement sequence and then everyone will be in breakout rooms to practice. So right from the first week, you'll be starting to use your voice to beginning to facilitate. And again, the first week is mountain pose and Shavasana. We're just gonna talk about guiding people through sort of standing and posture. Um, there's also a weekly mindfulness activity. So at the end of each live class, you'll have kind of an assignment for a mindfulness activity to be aware of through the week. Uh, and again, those are things like, for this week, be aware in everything that you do, or as many times as you think of it, <laughs> um, to notice your breath and posture. So, you know, where are you, where are you when, you know, either your posture is not what it usually is, or you're feeling tired, or when your breath is labored or excited, and just to start to make note of that, which then will feed into our next practical lesson the week after. So it gives you an opportunity to really begin that self-study. Um, we ultimately say, think like 10 to 12 hours a week of total commitment for your study, your online portion, our live meetups, and, and sort of this practical mindfulness activity. So does that answer the question? <laughs> Thanks. And then I also dropped um, our kind of training page, which will go a little bit deeper into the training. Um, and you're always welcome to, Kim says thank you, so I think that's a yes. Um, you're also always welcome to email any of us after as well, any questions that you have. Um, and then I think we can jump into this question too. Um, are there any plans to create a 300 hour yoga teacher training for those who have completed a 200 hour YTT? Um, can I answer and then and then you can talk about advanced trainings? Okay, um, so I know that there are, um, we do want to offer more advanced trainings, but I kind of woven this in earlier. Um, we have had a lot of people who have done a 200 hour yoga teacher training come and do our training um, and have had a completely different experience of this training. Um, I think, especially if you hadn't done a trauma informed training before, um, there are a lot of differences in modality and framework for offering this training. Um, and then what's also beneficial that we offer, um, our assistant director, Nicole, has created a, what's the language of it? Um, basically, there's like a, a training, once you go through our training, where we offer you the support to pitch your own programming to a local prison or jail. Um, we have spreadsheets and budgets and we have proposal letters. Um, so there's also a lot of um, support you get by going through our training and um, whether it's our yoga teacher training or our foundational training. Um, so I think also just being involved in this community, um, there's all these ways that we can serve and, and support you. Um, Jen, is there anything you wanna add to um, more advanced training? No, I think you've got, I mean, eventually, I would say the first round that we did this, it really was more of a 300. The folks who graduated from the first cohort um, will tell you it was pretty dense and heavy. Um, but more than half of our former graduates completed a, a 200 hour. A couple of them even had a 500 hour um, prior to doing this. And again, it was more, I think, looking at where you're called to serve and that we're truly looking at the practice of yoga from a place of healing um, that doesn't necessarily, I mean, I, I loved my 200 hour. It's amazing. The teacher was wonderful, but there were so many things when I finally got into a facility that just weren't appropriate for, for a studio education and, and to be able to be taught. Um, again, just if you just take hands-on assists and just look at that little tiny bubble, um, you know, it, it can't happen. It, it, it shouldn't happen in a trauma-informed environment wherever you are, but it can happen within a facility. So even learning approaches to be able to cue when it's only your voice and your ability to demonstrate, and then to empower individuals to sort of find these postures safely, but supportively for themselves. Um, like just even that tiny aspect of it was, was staggeringly different. Um, the approach to the sequencing is very, very different. Um, you know, the philosophy remains the same, but we're looking at it very specifically through a social justice and a leadership lens. So we're examining, you know, we're examining addiction and we're, we're looking at access within our worlds. We're looking at mass incarceration, um, you know, as we study brahmacharya, we're just, we're bringing in these yoga philosophies 
but looking at, at the things within our world to prepare folks again to realize where you want to serve. Um, so while we would love to eventually get into that 300 hour, um, there's there's a lot of new things within the 200 hour as well for folks who have completed one already. Um, so. and, I, and I think that weaves in perfectly to this next question um, from Lucas, because uh, you know we're talking about studio practice maybe versus a prison practice. Um, so they're interested in hearing some of the operational differences such as like you know do we use sanskrit terms um setting people up in an arc so nobody is left behind um different kind of terms or how does a trauma-informed training or facilitation differ from maybe a normal yoga studio training or class so i mean a lot of ways um I mean, just from the start. So again, we come in, we're starting with a more aggressive movement. So you're welcoming folks in, um, you know, we're clarifying the consent to be able to, to be here and to hold this space with folks. But our, our first sort of course of action is sort of that aggressive erratic side of movement. So we're, we're doing some shaking, um, you know, different types of jumping, depending on the folks who you're serving. And then we come into kind of more of what would be a dynamic movement. So where you're again, kind of looking at your traditional yoga, but then we're gonna start with you know, our movements of the spine, but geared into a way where the accessibility of folks who are gonna be in most of these settings outside a yoga studio, they don't have yoga experience. So to be able to even hold your arms like this is, is not accessible and possible for a lot of folks. So to really learn, you know, we do a lot of things with chair, a lot of things to really encourage and normalize the use of props, um, but to guide folks through. So it's not about, we're gonna do our sun salutations and then we're gonna come into our sun B and now we're gonna hold our posture and we're gonna do our balances. We're incorporating, like I said a little bit earlier, there's maybe four or five yoga postures throughout the entire duration of the class. And much more of it is allowing these individuals to be back in touch with how their body moves and works, to understand where their muscles are talking to them, to bring in that place of mindfulness, which I think does exist in a traditional class, but the facilitators are offering, you know, for example, if we were standing, so hands around a chair, you know, you're gonna just step back so you can comfortably put your heel down. So this, this would be warrior one in a trauma-informed class, you know, to come in and hold a chair where, you know, you could be much more into this sort of thing in the studio. You know, again, our warrior two, stand, you know, comfortably here, bend into your knee. This could be your warrior two, something where you're allowing, again, for the folks within this space to feel comfort and confidence in the movement that they're doing, but to also understand what does your range of motion even look like or mean? You know, you're, you're thinking of folks who, you know, there's, there's significant victims of violence, folks who are you know, killing from gunshot wounds, you know, people who have had sexual trauma and violations, who have disassociated with so much of their body that you know, the practice of yoga, the movements and the postures and the breathing is really supportive, but it, you know, it took, I wanna say six months before we were in child's pose and down dog in the women's class. And that was getting a relationship with me. It was finding comfort within themselves. It was getting the, the strength and the mobility within their hamstrings to come into the posture. There's so many different factors. So again, you're, you're presenting a movement and a breath awareness class using some yoga postures. Um, as far as Sanskrit, we don't really teach it for all the postures that we do teach and go through. And we, we go, there's 54 postures that we, we go over. We do do, you know, we learn how to sequence and, and cue a sun salutation. We go into the traditional postures and movement, but we're also making recommendations of what for the general population in a jail or a prison, these are definitely inaccessible, you know, and these are some things where as you're presenting it with your body, this is where you go. You know, so maybe we're coming into sort of a dragon lunge or a deeper lunge, but you as facilitator, whether you need to or not, you're gonna make sure that you're using your blocks to make sure that you're encouraging folks to use their blocks. Um, and I like to, to, to 
We typically do a very specific anatomical cue, then name the posture in English or the language of the majority of the folks. And then if you want, occasionally to bring in that Sanskrit name. Um, a lot of times if you're in a jail, your turnover of folks, you might see this like one person one week and then they're not there again. If you're in a prison where there's folks who are there a little bit longer, you can establish a bit of a longer relationship and those classes might start to evolve to, to look a little more like a traditional yoga class where you're, you're, you're giving a little bit more as folks uh, are getting comfortable and curious about their own practice. So. There's so many words to all of these. Like, there's so many ways to answer all these questions. Um, I hope that that gave enough of a starter of the information that you're looking for. And we have a couple other questions I think that tie together. Um, talking about actually facilitating inside. So the first one, I actually just dropped a link for you, Shay. Um, you know, you're talking about being a little bit nervous about going and teaching into a prison. Um, and I actually dropped a whole other webinar. Um, one of our LA facilitators, LA County facilitators, Kristen Varner, um, we did an entire webinar talking about um, like the leap of faith that you take in the beginning. Um, she had never taught inside before. Um, and then we interviewed her a couple months after she had just started. So we specifically talk about um, what it's like to begin. So I thought that would be, be a great place to start. Um, Priscilla is um, answering questions about our foundational training, which I'll talk about as well. Um, but we have a question. Um, uh, they start, thank you for sharing your path and passion, Jen. I recently started teaching post COVID in a women's facility in New York. I have taught pre COVID for several years. Does your program address issues faced by teachers and facilities that may impede the progress or growth of the program, such as dealing appropriately with staff and program coordinators? Definitely. Um, because we face it every day, but I think that there's so many, um, I think one thing that's important to remember is when we're allowed to go in <laughs> to a facility, it's about the folks we're serving. You know, in one of the facilities that I teach in right now, um, you know, we're just getting a lot of really silly pushback with, with just random things that um, I remember at one point, the women weren't allowed to practice unless they had socks and shoes on. And because in case there was a fire drill, they had to be able to come out, which wasn't comfortable. And then they said, well, they can take their shoes off, but they have to keep their socks off. And they were slipping and they were falling. And it's just sort of, and again, this is a really broad thing and it doesn't address a lot of other stuff. Um, but we've also had instances where during like count where an officer has to come in during the yoga class um, where the officers are just stepping on their mats and they'll come in. So some will sort of stay off to the side, they'll take a head count, they'll leave, and others will physically come into the space, will step on the yoga mats of the women and kind of come through to, again, add that additional level of intimidation. Um, never a class goes by where officers don't walk by the big window that, that is in the room that we're in and they don't like do like a thing or like mock the pose that we're doing. Um, another facility I teach at, the officers participate, like they're there, they're super supportive, that there's some places where I think it's it's another reason why we spend so much time on ourselves and understanding, like as you're going into these environments to serve, you're gonna get angry. You're gonna be, there's gonna be things and you're gonna see and witness and hear of things that, that are inhumane, that are inappropriate, that, you know, are just stressful. You know, every single, between the food diet, between the living conditions. Um, one of the classes I teach is right on the living unit of where the women are. There's, it's filthy. You know, there's just, there's so many things that, you know, on a regular basis um, are really disheartening. And it's another reason why this community is so important too, to be able to have a place that like, I need to talk about what happened at this facility today because, you know, there's a difference between sort of advocating for what, you know, like, like I, we won't in another facility, I won't teach in the gym because to teach in the gym, every individual has to be searched completely before and after class. And to me, that is an unnecessary violation of every single individual, both before and after they practice that to go through the women are uncomfortable with it. They don't want to do it. You know, it's just, it's, it's unnecessary. So 
we could have a larger class in this big, beautiful gym space, or we could practice in the chapel and with a limited number, but everyone keeps their integrity and they're not having to be put through this other system that the, the facility has in place. So, you know, we talk about a lot of this and as the mentors and things come in too, I think for every time we have a new facilitator or someone in a different part of the country in a different part of the world to come in and to really talk about the conditions, the things that we're seeing and experiencing, um, which also gives us a little bit of fuel to start to be part of the restorative justice model going forward, you know, to be able to bring things in either to the administration as we're talking and negotiating our program. It's things that we can learn to be able to offer to the women or the men that we're guiding. Um, in a lot of facilities, people can't not have shoes on in general, like not even just in the class, but what that's doing to the structure and the integrity of people's feet um, is abysmal that, that, you know, one of the women who actually is out now, but is working um, for our PYP in New Hampshire as a program coordinator, um, she's still going through significant physical therapy because her feet are in such poor shape of having to wear the same shoes for, for the years that she was incarcerated. So we've started to add a lot of fascial foot massage into practices in all the facilities that I teach in because it's this common thing um, everywhere. So I think that we, we learn some good stuff with the bad things that we're witnessing of what we can truly bring to support the folks we're serving. But we also need to find constructive ways to be able to fight the battles that are bigger, that we know we need to make those changes within the facilities. And you sort of come in as the yoga teacher where you're not really taken seriously anyway. <laughs> but, you know, as we slowly begin to realize, or as the facilities begin to realize the impactful and beneficial changes the folks are experiencing, sometimes that works a little bit more into the resentment side of the yoga program, and sometimes it gives a little bit more support. So it will forever be um, an absolute topic of discussion, both in any kind of training, in our facilitator training, in the foundational training, in the YTT, and among our community within one another is protecting ourselves from the forces that are also damaging and causing harm to the folks we're serving. Herein lies the problem of <laughs> all of it. You know, it's a vicious cycle of, um, you know, folks are not given an opportunity to heal when they're incarcerated. Um, and that's something that we face every single time we walk in the door. And, to, and thank you for so beautifully said, Jen, right? Um, you know, consistently being reminded of a broken system that we serve within, right? And, you know, and there's many opportunities, I feel like we all feel like just burn it down, just, you know, like, but we can't, right? There's, there's not, we, we can't. And so it's, re it really is coming back to the people that we serve, right? Um, and then also to add to is that we offer twice a month um, peer facilitation opportunities. So you can come and be with our uh, core team and ask these questions. Um, and so I think that's also another added benefit of going through our training um, and being part of this community is we really offer, um, we're always available, right? We're always available. And we really see this as a community and that we are better together. Um, and uh, it's hard to do this work alone. And I know that you did this work, you know, alone for a, a while. So and we're so happy that you're, <laughs> you're here. I'm happy to be here. No, it's, it's, yeah, very happy to be here. <laughs> but it is, there's just, there's a lot of reasons to be really, really, really upset with so many things that happen in our world. Um, you know, and, and our prison systems are just one of the ways that, that humans are so grossly mistreated within our world. Um, but that, you know, again, it comes back to that foundation of need resources to be able to protect our own self and our own energy. So we are strong and capable and prepared to go out and do this work that's so important. And it's just without having that time to really check in with yourself and to check in with others and to have those really strong supportive tools um, you know, you know, there's a whole section in the training on just the risk of burnout and how can we kind of alleviate some of that. Um, so we really, we go into, you know, really as many aspects of this whole big picture of what this type of service means um, to really protect the individual 
and to, to build the service and to pass that on, those lessons of self-care. Um. So I kind of want to add a couple little nitty gritty things um, about the training at the end, but I know that we're coming towards time. So I just wanted to give you the last words and, and just share if there's anything that we haven't touched on today that you would want to share to our audience or maybe someone who is thinking about um, starting to work in system places with system impacted people. Well, for me to do that, <laughs> I thought we were going to let everyone else. Um, just thank you for being here today. Thank you for showing up with curiosity for, for this talk and this program. Um, you know, I, again, listen to that little voice. So if there's a part of you that just is curious, thinks that this might be something that is aligned with the next steps of your path, um, you know, even if you're not ready to, to register or to sign up or to take next steps here, um, like Blair said, we're always here. You know, I, I can drop my email here. Just reach out to us and connect. That this work is, it's really profound. Like it, it's, it's surreal almost in the way that, you know, having an opportunity to witness folks going through their healing journey and you know they're not always success stories there are folks who come back that there is a high recidivism rate but you know being able to be part of changing the stigmas and the assumptions and biases against individuals within our communities again wherever they are that, that people deserve to be comfortable in their heads and in their bodies and so much of the reason why they're not is because of the way they're viewed or observed or judged or shamed for who they are and we have to come to a point where that stops. So this little program might be something that you can add to your own toolbox and the service work that you're doing out in the world and in your communities. I'd really love for you to give us a chance um, to, to do that. But wherever you go, just know that you're not alone in your service work and that um, there are incredible, amazing humans out there who just need to be seen and heard. And that's kind of it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you. This has been awesome.